Do not fear to be eccentric in opinion, for every opinion now accepted was once eccentric. Of all forms of caution, caution in love is perhaps the most fatal to true happiness. The fundamental cause of trouble is that in the modern world, the stupid are cocksure, while the intelligent are full of doubt. To fear love is to fear life, and those who fear life are already three parts dead. I would never die for my beliefs because I might be wrong. A stupid man's report of what a clever man says can never be accurate because he unconsciously translates what he hears into something he can understand. And if there were a God, I think it very unlikely that he would have such an uneasy vanity as to be offended by those who doubt his existence. Three passions, simple but overwhelmingly strong, have governed my life. The longing for love, the search for knowledge, and unbearable pity for the suffering of mankind. In all affairs, it is a healthy thing now and then to hang a question mark on the things you have long taken for granted. One of the symptoms of an approaching nervous breakdown is the belief that one's work is terribly important. Our great democracies still tend to think that a stupid man is more likely to be honest than a clever man. And our politicians take advantage of this prejudice by pretending to be even more stupid than nature made them. I do not pretend to be able to prove that there is no God. I equally cannot prove that Satan is a fiction. The Christian God may exist so may the gods of Olympus, or of ancient Egypt, or Babylon. But none of these hypotheses is more probable than any other. They lie outside the region of even probable knowledge. And therefore, there is no reason to consider any of them. Fear is the main source of superstition and one of the main sources of cruelty to conquer fear is the beginning of wisdom. The hardest thing to learn in life is which bridge to cross and which to burn. It's easy to fall in love. The hard part is finding someone to catch you. To teach how to live without certainty and yet without being paralyzed by hesitation is perhaps the chief thing that philosophy in our age can still do for those who study it. Most people would sooner die than think. In fact, they do so. Men fear thought as they fear nothing else on earth, more than ruin, more even than death. Thought is subversive and revolutionary, destructive and terrible. Thought is merciless to privilege, established institutions and comfortable habits. Thought is anarchic and lawless, indifferent to authority, careless of the well-tried wisdom of the ages. Thoughts look into the pit of hell and is not afraid. Thought 
is great and swift and free, the light of the world and the chief glory of man. My desire and wish is that the things I start with should be so obvious that you wonder why I spend my time stating them. This is what I aim at because the point of philosophy is to start with something so simple as to not seem worth stating and to end with something so paradoxical that no one will believe it. It is the preoccupation with possessions more than anything else that prevents us from living freely and nobly. When you want to teach children to think, you begin by treating them seriously when they are little, giving them responsibilities, talking to them candidly, providing privacy and solitude for them, and making them readers and thinkers of significant thoughts from the beginning. That's if you want to teach them to think. Those who have never known the deep intimacy and the intense companionship of happy, mutual love have missed the best thing that life has to give. Collective fear stimulates herd instinct and tends to produce ferocity towards those who are not regarded as members of the herd. We know very little, and yet it is astonishing that we know so much, and still more astonishing that so little knowledge can give us so much power. No one gossips about other people's secret virtues. It has been said that man is a rational animal. All my life I have been searching for evidence which could support this. One should, as a rule, respect public opinion insofar as is necessary to avoid starvation and keep out of prison. But anything that goes beyond this is voluntary submission to an unnecessary tyranny and is likely to interfere with happiness in all kinds of ways. The secret of happiness is to face the fact that the world is horrible, horrible, horrible. One of the painful things about our time is that those who feel certainty are stupid, and those with any imagination and understanding are filled with doubt and indecision. The fact that an opinion has been widely held is no evidence whatever that it is not utterly absurd. Indeed, in view of the silliness of the majority of mankind, a widely spread belief is more likely to be foolish than sensible. I have sought love, first because it brings ecstasy, ecstasy so great that I would often have sacrificed all the rest of life for a few hours of this joy. I have sought it next because it relieves loneliness, that terrible loneliness in which one shivering consciousness looks over the rim of the world into the cold, unfathomable, lifeless abyss. I have sought it finally because the union of love I have seen in a mystic miniature the prefiguring vision of the heaven that saints and poets have imagined. This is what I sought, and though it might seem too good for human life, this is what, at last, I have found. With equal passion, I have sought knowledge. I have wished to understand the hearts of men. 
I have wished to know why the stars shine, and I have tried to apprehend the Pythagorean power by which number holds sway above the flux. A little of this, but not too much, I have achieved. Love and knowledge, so far as they were possible, led upward towards the heavens. But always pity brought me back to earth. Echoes of cries of pain reverberate in my heart. Children in famine, victims tortured by oppressors, helpless old people, a burden to their children, and the whole world of loneliness, poverty, and pain make a mockery of what human life should be. I long to alleviate this evil, but I cannot, and I too suffer. This has been my life. I have found it worth living, and would gladly live it again if the chance were offered me. These illustrations suggest four general maxims. The first is, remember that your motives are not always as altruistic as they seem to yourself. The second is, don't ever overestimate your own merits. The third is, don't expect others to take as much interest in you as you do yourself. And the fourth is, don't imagine that people give enough thought to you to have any special desire to persecute you. The infliction of cruelty with a good conscience is a delight to moralists. That is why they invented hell. Patriots always talk of dying for their country, but never of killing for their country. There is something feeble and a little contemptible about a man who cannot face the perils of life without the help of comfortable myths. Almost inevitably, some part of him is aware that they are myths and that he believes them only because they are comforting. But he dare not face his thought. Moreover, since he is aware, however dimly, that his opinions are not rational, he becomes furious when they are disputed. Neither a man, nor a crowd, nor a nation can be trusted to act humanely or to think sanely under the influence of a great fear. So far as I can remember, there is not one word in the Gospels in praise of intelligence. If there were in the world today any large number of people who desired their own happiness more than they desired the unhappiness of others, we could have a paradise in a few years. The secret to happiness is this. Let your interest be as wide as possible and let your reactions to the things and persons who interest you be as far as possible friendly rather than hostile. Love is wise. Hatred is foolish. In this world, which is getting more and more closely interconnected, we have to learn to tolerate each other. We have to learn to put up with the fact that some people say things we don't like. We can only live together in that way. But if we are to live together and not die together, we must learn a kind of charity, a kind of tolerance, which is absolutely vital to the continuation of human life on this planet.